We have started working actually in 2003. We did team up with UNCTAD and IFOAM. UNCTAD being the organization that deals with trade and development, and IFOAM representing civil society. And FAO's interest is to work on the basis of common standards, such as the Codex Alimentarius Commission guidelines for organic food. The problem is that there is a multiplication of standards and regulations and certification requirements which are creating trade barriers and difficulties for producers to access markets. There is a tendency recently to have more regional coalitions and this really stems from the fact that in the EU we have regional standards for the whole region which does not prevent countries to have their own application of those common standards for the European market. So one of the work we have been doing is to have a common standard for the Asian countries. It's a standard that has started developing last year and which will be ready next year. It includes 12 countries in Asia. And the major challenge is that we are working with countries that have been regulating for a long time and have their own standards, such as India. And we have extremely small countries who don't have any kind of standards, like Bhutan, for example. To put together a common standard, which is like a common denominator of these countries, means that you have to have the buy-in of these countries to be able to work together and to come into an agreement in order to facilitate intra-regional trade in the first instance, and in the future to be a critical mass to have more strengths for their export toward other regions such as Europe or the USA. The FAO has uh, developed um, international guidelines for the eco-labeling of fish and fish products from marine capture fisheries. Now, the main reason for which the FAO has done this is because eco-labeling schemes started to be developed in the last 15-20 years as a result of general perception or government perception that fisheries were not being well managed and there was a need to develop eco-labels to certify that they were well managed. The main purpose of these guidelines is to develop an international standard that will allow eco-labeling schemes to be developed in a fair, transparent and predictable manner. The guidelines have been developed and they've now been available for a couple of years and there has been a question about whether or not eco-labeling schemes are complying with the guidelines. As a result, FAO is now developing a benchmarking framework that will allow this assessment to be made. And once this assessment will be made, the industry will be able to decide whether or not they want to certify their fishery against an eco-labeling scheme. The problem is not the existence of private food safety standards, no, because many countries' legislation requires that the food industry take actions to be responsible for ensuring that the food that they produce is safe. And the private food safety standards are their response to this, their legal responsibility to produce safe food. So it is not that private standards in themselves are bad, it is that private food safety standards developed in a way that does not encourage participation of the key stakeholders, includes a certain amount of detail that can exclude small producers. So the problem is related to the process by which these standards are developed. There is an increase in demand from countries to strengthen the protection against unregulated standards and against the fraudulent practices in food products labeling and the use of different marks and traits. Strengthening the national legal framework that governs the different aspects related to a standard, who can approve a standard what are the elements of standards that need to be legally set up. What's going to happen if a partner makes an unfair use of a standard? The 
main participants and stakeholders involved in the World Banana Forum are the companies that work in the banana industry, producer associations, smallholders and small growers cooperatives, non-governmental organizations that work in the field of environmental protection, human rights, trade unions, banana worker unions, and some governments also that are either producing or importing bananas. So the main objective is to build consensus on best practices for the banana sector in terms of environmental protection, in terms of addressing uh, climate change issues and mitigating the impact of the banana industry on climate change, in terms of you know, promoting respect for uh, labour rights, for promoting gender equality, and promoting a fair distribution of value along the supply chain for bananas. The main challenge is to find funding from external donors to support the activities of the forum and especially its secretariat and participation by people from developing countries in the activities of the forum. The role of the FAO is to facilitate the forum and the Trade and Markets Division of FAO acts as the secretariat of the forum and plays the role of a facilitator. Over the past few years, a number of voluntary standards for the certification of biofuels or of specific biofuel feedstocks such as sugarcane and palm oil have been developed, mostly in response to concerns about the environmental and socio-economic sustainability in the production of these commodities. The FAO's Bioenergy and Food Security Criteria Indicators Project has compiled 13 of these voluntary standards into an interactive web-based tool that allows users to compare um, across these standards and to benchmark them against the main regulatory frameworks. So what are the lessons learned out of this compilation of uh, bioenergy sustainability initiatives that we prepared? Well, all of them really address a broad range of sustainability issues, especially on the environmental side. Some of them also address a number of social sustainability issues, such as land tenure and labour conditions. But what is really lacking in this case is specific uh, thresholds and clear assessment guidelines. Uh, with regard to one of the most highly debated issues in the area of bioenergy, so the potential competition between bioenergy production and food production and food security as a whole, um, we've noticed that only a few of these standards make explicit reference uh, to this issue and none of them has really uh, succeeded so far in addressing this issue in all of its complexity. And this is exactly where the Bioenergy and Food Security Criteria and Indicators Project has decided to focus uh, its efforts and has developed a set of tools that can be used to assess the effects, both positive and negative, of bioenergy on food security at both the national macro level and at project level. The result of the three case studies undertaken in Thailand, Mali and Peru was that at this point as the standards stand, there are additional challenges and not as many opportunities. And there's not any benefit at this point for including smallholders in the certification because of a lack of a price premium. And the existing mechanisms in the certification schemes allow for the inclusion of smallholders without certifying smallholders in the actual scheme. FAO can support smallholders in participating in not only global bioenergy value chains, but also bioenergy certification by first understanding what the challenges and opportunities are, which is what we've tried to undertake with our recent study, and then assessing baseline um, or collecting baseline data on what the exact challenges and potential impacts of certification are for smallholders, and then supporting them in capacity building and extension services so that they are able to become certified as the standards adjust the mechanisms. They are defined as an intellectual property right by WTO because they identify a product, a good, as originating from a specific place of production or the territory. It encompasses four elements, a specific quality on the product, specific practice along the process, a defined delimited area of production and a name and reputation that difference 
the product from, from the other. It's basically, we build their capacities at local level in identifying what are their original link products, in qualifying them, that is to say, to elaborate the code of practice and to promote and marketing. Another key element and, and challenge is it's related to the qualification phase. When we talked about qualification phase, it's about the elaboration of the code of practice or specification. That is a document which defines what is the specific quality, what is the product and what are the requirements to use the GI. We also have projects in Africa, in Mali and Guinea. In Mali, we are working with producers' organizations that produce shallot in order to improve uh, the quality and the marketing of a product with a label called uh, Echalote du Pays d'Ogon. That could uh, lead to geographical indication in the future. We are working with local and national markets, so it's very important to identify the market and also the stakeholders, not only the producers, but also the traders and uh, the retailers. The market linkages in Africa are sometimes very informal, so it is difficult to put a, a label like a geographical indication. The first benefit for a GI is uh, the recognition of the name of the product. Uh, as Emily said, it's a uh, property right and uh, national authority could recognize this uh, name uh, officially. Uh, the second benefit is uh, the differentiation of the product through uh, the quality and the improvement of the quality. The third uh, benefit is related with the organization of the producers and how the GI can strengthen the management of uh, the producer organization, also the marketing and uh, reinforce uh, all uh, organization of producers and other actors. FEO executed a project in West Africa which was funded by Germany to help farmer organizations get organic and fair trade certification and export to Europe. Products included organic shea butter, organic mango, organic pineapple and fair trade cocoa. It turned out that it was quite easy to set up internal control systems and get certified. However, farm organizations had more difficulties to meet other market requirements. Even as some organic and fair trade buyers may be more flexible in terms of volume and timely delivery requirements, but still this was a major problem for farmer organizations. And consumers want a good quality product because they are paying a premium for the labeled products. So for organic and fair trade products, quality requirements may be even more stringent than in conventional markets. We spent a lot of time training the organizations in management skills and also in training farmers to comply with the standard requirements but also to improve their quality. One of the main challenges was the logistic and operational management skills because there are not a lot of training materials available that are suitable for farmer organizations. We have different activities in this project. We support, for instance, capacity building to farmers and, and farmers' organizations, post-harvest management or marketing strategies. We also support technicians from government NGOs or, or services providers in inspection and certification, supporting the conformity assessment system. In the case of Guatemala, we provide also co-financing investments at the farm level, at the farmers' organization level. Without, they will not be able to be certified. The rate of success is almost 85%. That means almost all are now exporting GAP certified products. At this point, it was uh, mainly uh, through this capacity building, but also other support services. We provide marketing strategies, we provide business skills, a network of services providers in different aspects. The challenges they face are the level of investment needed to comply with the standards and the operational cost. So service provision, marketing strategies and market linkages, technical support, financing resources to co-finance investments are integral part of the compliance packages for small-scale farmers.